Fox. It is a big week for Disney, a very big one. The company hosting its annual shareholder meeting. It's going to happen on Wednesday. The deadline for votes in what could be the most expensive proxy battle in history. Activist investor Nelson Pelton, his firm Tryon Fund Management, looking to try to boot two Disney directors off the board. Both sides have picked up some big name support just late last week. California's CalPERS pension fund said uh, that it had voted in favor of Pelts and Tryon's uh, other board nominee. Join us right now on all this is Jeff Sonnenfeld, Yale School of Management Senior Associate Dean for Leadership Studies and a CNBC contributor. And I should say, uh, somebody who has been a very vocal backer uh, in recent weeks, if not over the past month and a half, of Bob Iger and the current team. Jeff, are you surprised at some of the, the names that we've heard come out in favor of, uh, uh, of Tryon and of Nelson Peltz over the past couple of weeks, given uh, your vociferous report and, uh, or, or words, and not just uh, words, but data, uh, which you have tried to suggest and show uh, that the current board and under Bob Iger is doing a much better job than perhaps it, Nelson Peltz uh, is willing to acknowledge? Fantastic opening question. I am disappointed. Uh, you know, it's uh, Fred Allen once said that uh, imitation is the highest form of television. He should have said the, the highest form of, of, of governance, governistas, is ISS uh, has uh, consistently gotten them wrong from their backing of Enron, or WorldCom, Carl Yafrina at, at HP. It's uh, no, it's, it's disappointing. And what they did is they absolutely conflated but if you look at their report, which they're not happy about, they try to get us to suppress the report, is that Bob Iger uh, and, and Bob Chapek are confused in their data. They combined the two, which is crazy. So, of course, the performance looked down for the two years that the, of the three they right. looked at. Jeff, let me ask you, though, specifically about that, because, you know, when you look at, at some of the tables and data that you've put together, what you do, and, and I'm sure there's a debate over this, is you exclude the period of time uh, and maybe this should be obvious uh, between the time that Bob Iger uh, stepped down and handed the reins to uh, Bob Chapek and the time that Bob Iger uh, came back. And during those periods, if, if you remove the Chapek period, of course, uh, things look uh, materially better. There is a question mark, and this is the argument that Nelson Peltz and other investors, by the way, would make, which is to say that a lot of the things that happened during the Chapek period were decisions that were started in the Bob Iger era, and therefore he should be, quote unquote, credited or demerited or however you want to think about it uh, with uh, some of some of that. Uh, these are decisions that uh, Bob Chapek, it's not a dispute. Somebody can create a haze. Bob Chapek is the one who greenlit those loser films. Uh, 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 Bob uh, uh, Iger had uh, eight of the uh, top 10, uh, uh, 15 of the, uh, 13 of the top 20 all-time box office successes. Every, you know, all those were, were greater than a billion dollars. Every film under JPEG didn't come close to a billion dollars. It was, and they were disasters. Under Bob uh, Iger, just this calendar year, just forget history then, look at this calendar year. This is the number one Dow stock. Disney is the number, it's up uh, 33, 34% as of this morning. 583% total shareholder return last time that he was in charge, and now we're up right. at 34%. There's nobody like that. Towers over every media peer. You name it, Fox, uh, Warner, uh, Paramount, Jeff, they're all... I, I, Jeff, they but, but, and I'm not, I'm not disputing uh, your, your perspective or your thought, but my question is this, and this is the piece that I'm trying to understand. There were also a number of films, by the way, that have come out during Bob Iger's uh, new reign, if you will, that haven't been uh, as well received as I think uh, the market or Disney would have liked. Some of those films were created, hold on, were created during the Bob Chapek period, right? And now, and so then the question is, does he get credited or demerited for that? My, my, my only point is, it's very hard, I think, especially because there was only a, a short period of time. You could say maybe Bob Chapek uh, did a disastrous job during that period. But um, nonetheless, during that period, some of, some of what Chapek was living with was clearly things that Bob Iger had, had done. And some of the things that Bob Iger is living with today are things that Chapek had done. Is that not fair? There's always going to be a little bit of carryover, but the, the films this past summer, if just look at the time frame, these were all greenlit by JPEG that were, that were huge disappointments. If you take a look at the, at the arc of Bob Iger's career, those uh, uh, eight out of top 10 all-time uh, you know, box offices and 13 out of top 20 
can't be erased. That's you can't erase history. Uh, even we learned with Michael J. Fox and Back to the Future, we can't reinvent, reinvent the past. Is that he, in fact, uh, performed incredibly well in the film right. business? Total shareholder return, nothing like it. But who are we looking at the other side of the aisle? Where are people coming up with these rosy, uh, uh, you know, uh, celebrations of one of the greatest failing financiers out there today? Iger is a genuine wizard in value creation. Pels is a genuine value destroyer. So, the by the way, Jeff, this is, so then here's the piece that I don't understand. If you are right, and I'm not disputing, you may very well be right about all of this. The question, therefore, is how is it possible that an ISS, I know you called them mistaken, how is it an ISS? How is it a CalPERS? How is some of the some of the articles that we've read and other things, which I know you, you have views about, have taken a very Nelson Peltz uh, supportive position? Well, there is such a. What do you think is going on there? If, if it's There's as obvious a... as you say it is, and, and by the way, to me it's almost obvious, but I, and I sort of think it's inexplicable what's happening here. But I'm curious how you sort of rationalize it. Because sometimes propaganda confuses people. You get somebody with a great deal of bluster. Nelson Peltz, he's not only and he failed, you know, 15 out of 22 of his investments uh, where he's been on the board uh, have uh, dramatically underperformed the S&P. He has no success as a, as a financier. And, if, and, and, and where his experience is, it's in industrial and consumer goods where he's been failing. Right. He doesn't know anything about entertainment. The only thing entertaining is when he does these filibusters on TV right. shows with comically naive statements. And that confuses some investors in the governance arena. There is such a thing as groupthink, and some fall into that. And these are the same people that endorsed Enron, WorldCom, Carly Fiorina right. at HP. So they make mistakes, and they make a mistake here. And by the way, we're not talking about that much. Is uh, is we're, if we're talking about CalPERS, we're talking about 0.3% right. of the stock. It's not worth hey, the time. Hey, Jeff, a, a, a great supporter of Bob Iger said, said recently to me, you know, the good news is he may succeed and the, in, in this and that the board will uh, uh, be his, if you will. But from a shareholder perspective, it is unlikely that even if Nelson Peltz loses, that he really goes away and that actually that pressure unto itself might actually be a good thing. I don't know if you think it's a good thing or a bad thing, which is to say that it will that the Disney is now on notice, and all of a sudden there will be another year-long uh, stretch where we will see what the performance of Disney is, and people will decide in a year if it appears that Bob Iger is having great success, uh, Nelson Peltz will go away. But if uh, he's not having great success, uh, someone said just like Donald Trump, he'll be back. It, you know, it's such a good question. That, that our friend Becky next to you there tried it twice with Matt Bologna an hour ago of Puck, and, and he, I think he, he, he caught it the second round and wondering what happens if we come close on a vote? He doesn't go away. Do they somehow make concessions to him? I can tell you factually that several board members tell me they rue the day they made such a, a, a Faustian deal with Peltz on the uh, uh, Procter & Gamble board. It was a constant dripping faucet. He came up with no ideas other than to move uh, M&A down into, the, into local divisions, which was crazy, and to relocate the headquarters from Cincinnati for no particular reason. And uh, as you know, in PepsiCo, it, Ingenuity succeeded by ignoring him. They didn't heave off uh, Pepsi International from Pepsi Domestic and, and, and combine Frito-Lay with his losing hand in Mondelez. Uh, no, they ignored his suggestion. So uh, they're not good. But but it's a good that you guys raise it because you and Becky are right. This is 25 times that this octogenarian with nothing else to do. I guess he doesn't want to play the senior circuit in golf and he's not good at Mahjong or, or bingo. This is what he wants to do to fill his day. He and, and this is other people's money, by the way. He has even combined with Ike Perlmutter, who is most of the lion's share of what he has here, it's about, you know, 1.5 percent we're looking at here. And again, most of that is Perlmutter's. Amazingly, right. Peltz, Peltz sold a, a, about, a, you know, right. a, a half of his shares, a third of his shares already. You know, so what's, what, you know, what's he doing yeah. here? The session uh, plan is very strong. Uh, their Fox deal, it was actually created about $74 billion of value. He just created a lot of noise out of nonsense and people, people got confused.